All right, well, completing Akihiko's story did not open up whatever story is right here, which I'm guessing is Elizabeth, since chat reminded me that we fought Elizabeth in Narukami's episode. So, I, next we just do Igus's. Are you awake? I'm sorry. I had turned off my consciousness to test the new equipment installed on me. Yes, that's why we use the emergency channel. We've been asked to go into action. Has something happened? Who sent the request? We'll brief you on the details in transit. Also, regulations say that the member with the lowest serial number is in command. Currently, that's you. I'm in command? Are you sure about this? After all, I'm... You're well suited for it, in my opinion. Understood. May 1st, 2012, 9.30. Men equipped with assault suits and tactical vests line the concrete ground. Their urban camouflage and unmoving poses give them the appearance of an orderly line of rocks. My favorite. 30 minutes have passed since the special assault team took up their positions on the landing strip surrounding the stopped passenger plane. Their captain glares at the plane before he slowly turns around and looks at each of his men. Every last one wears ski masks and thick tactical visors to mask their identities, but he knows them nonetheless. Tell me about the situation and make it quick. We don't have much time. Oh, this guy actually has a character portrait. One of the team members steps forward. The touchscreen tablet in his right hand has a summary of the chase on it. On May 1st, 2012, around 900 hours, a wide-body passenger aircraft headed for Kagoshima sent out a 7500 squat code during passenger boarding. Following the signal, the captain reported to the control tower that the aircraft had been hijacked. Since the uprising occurred during passenger boarding, only half the passengers, 168 exactly, had boarded. The 10 crew members being a total of 178 hostages thought to be on board. Some passengers seated near the hatch had succeeded in escaping. The following points were gained from questioning them. Take care not to be seen by the hijackers. There are three hijackers. All of them are covering their faces with ski masks. All of them are armed with what seem to be pistols. From their voices and builds, they appear to be males. They all spoke fluent Japanese. Currently, the aircraft in question has moved to the front of the landing strip and at the hijacker's insistence and has stopped there. The authorities have attempted to negotiate with the hijackers by radio, but they have made no demands. The team, members finishes, the team member finishes his report. The captain nods silently and addresses his team. There hasn't been a plane hijacked in this country in over 10 years. None of us, not even me, have dealt with this before. Still, the procedure remains the same. Trust yourself, remember your training, and keep a cool head. The captain turns towards the plane again. Taking that as a cue, the team scatters to their specified post to take up positions. The only thing to do now is to see what happens. Eventually, 10 o'clock comes around. Half an hour has passed with no new developments. Repeated attempts to contact the hijackers have been made, but they have yet to make any demands. Tensions are beginning to rise. The worst case scenario is that they have no need to make demands, that their objective is to seize the passenger plane itself. In this case, the team would be facing a large-scale terrorist attack. Come on, talk to us. The captain mutters to himself, deep in thought. From the perspective of rescuing the hostages, every second that passes without learning the hijackers object Hi hijackers? hijackers objective is a second wasted. The captain and his team can wait in hiding, but the same is not true of the passengers on board. For untrained civilians, extreme stress can easily lead to physical and mental problems. It's true not only for the hostages, but for the hijackers as well. When people lose their nerve, they tend to act rashly. The hostages will begin to lose hope, and the hijackers will begin taking it out on the hostages. An hour into the incident, anything could be happening inside the plane. The captain could do nothing but glare as the time ticked by. After 15 more minutes had passed, a slight change in the situation was reported. All emails and calls going through stations near the airport are being checked, but at the moment, no messages are thought to have been sent from inside the plane. It appeared that the hijackers had confiscated all cellular phones as per standard hijacking plans, Sir, but... a report from HQ. They picked up a transmission from one of the passengers' cell phones. Hold up a second. As per standard hijacking plans, like, w what's the standard? Who wrote the golden standard of hijacking, uh... Is that supposed to say hijacking planes, not plans, by the way? You know what? I'm, I'm done psychoanalyzing that. It's a smartphone with GPS, so they can tell it's inside the plane. Confirm those details for me. There are two possibilities. The hijackers are using a passenger's phone to contact associates outside, or a passenger is contacting someone in secret. The latter possibility is more likely. More and more devices have communication capabilities now, making it extremely difficult for hijackers to remove them entirely from play. And the more hostages there are involved, the more courageous they become, and the more likely they are to take risks. 
Unfortunately, more hostages involved means it's all the more dangerous to provoke the hijackers. Each individual hostage is worth less to them. The details of the transmission make it apparent that the situation is worse than the team had assumed. How to Hijack a Plane Properly, a book by Goro Akechi. I love it. The cell phone's owner is a man in his 60s in first class. He signed up for a certain service after being diagnosed with a heart illness. It's a remote EKG monitoring service that keeps track of the patient's heartbeat. A scheduled message was automatically sent from the patient's cell phone. The service provider promptly contacted the police, informing them that the man was in bad shape. The man's life is at stake if we don't wrap this up within the hour. It looks like we can't stall for time. As panic spreads, a proposal for negotiations based on this fact and a proposal to storm the plane are both considered. But because only half the passengers had boarded, the situation inside the plane is uncertain, making devising a tactical plan difficult. Though if nothing is done, a passenger will surely succumb within the hour. Oh my goodness. Do we really need to go through this whole, like, I guess super over psychoanalyzes the plane jacking thing? Like, we've already seen how the plane jacking plays out from Akihiko and Mitsuru's scenario. We And Naoto's. We really don't need... Oh no, we didn't see it from Akihiko's. He gave a brief overview of it, I think. But we saw it from Mitsuru and Naoto's perspective. We really don't need this in this game. A blunder like that must be avoided at all costs. That was the thinking that guided the police officials to make their decision. That same day at 10.30. What? Withdraw? This is a hijacking. What are you thinking withdrawing our people? Yes, I understand. Wait, what's going on? Orders are orders. We'll fall back at once. Get ready. No one understood this, this sudden withdrawal order. Why withdraw the team during a hijacking? No one on the scene agreed with the decision, but the order could not be overturned. The men here are not the brain, but limbs whose power is best put to use by precisely following orders. Just then, another group approaches without a sound. Its members are dressed differently in suits and trench coats, but all of them are wearing black and sunglasses. At a glance, it is clear that they are all tall, well-built, and, and used to rough situations. With nearly 20 of them gathered in one place, they are imposing despite their silence. They don't seem to be airport personnel, but neither are they known to the police. But the captain senses they're in the same line of work and approaches. Who are you? His voice is laced with suspicion, but the man at the head of the group speaks dispassionately as if he'd heard nothing. For the next half hour, we're in command of this scene. The men in black! They're gonna get Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones on this? Yo, Will Smith is, uh, he's in a bit of a predicament socially right now. I don't think he's prepared for this moment. Also, why are we back to this truly awful music? You didn't answer the question. Who's responsible for this? The captain's tone unconsciously hardens. The group of men in black parts in one of their number in the rear steps forth. The captain can't stop himself from furrowing his brow. He can already sense the unrest spreading amongst his team who watches in silence. The one stepping forward looks like a 17 or 18 year old girl. She is dressed in black and wears sunglasses like those around her, but her slender build is out of place. Her blonde hair stands out even more in contrast to her all black outfit. Who? The girl walks a few more steps forward and removes her sunglasses. Oh, it's just Igus. Okay. We were doing this from Igus's perspective, so when Igus was saying, like, a girl steps up from the back or whatever, you wouldn't think it's Igus, which is why when they say blonde hair, I'm like, who on earth could that be? It's not Naoto or Mitsuru. The captain had intended to appraise the look in her eyes, but only gasps in the face of her crystalline blue. He quickly regains himself and frowns. So you're the one in charge? Yes. Are you shitting me? There is no time to waste quarreling. The girl looks at him fearlessly, despite the armed team surrounding her. The absurdity of it all is what helps the captain get over his surprise. Her age and appearance are most likely meaningless. She is clearly no ordinary girl. Are you not even going to tell me who you're with? I cannot. So you expect me to hand over control of the scene to you without even telling me who the hell you are? I believe orders to withdraw have already been issued. Wait, that's a really good point. How did I just put on sunglasses? She doesn't have, like, actual ears, does she? Or, like, her headphone things there are, like, blocking it if she does have fake ears beneath them. I don't remember. It's been so long since I've seen Igus' ears if she even has them. Her calm, sweet voice only irritates him. The captain closes the distance to the girl, and while he stops short of grabbing her suit, he glares into those blue eyes from only inches away. Lady, I don't know what kind of juice you have with the brass, but are you ready to be responsible for the deaths of those passengers? Your protests are doing nothing to relieve the danger. Please stop this music. Rescuing them as soon as possible is my, or rather, our duty. <sighs> the girl is completely unruffled as she speaks. It's like she's a machine or something, the captain thinks, more dumbfounded than angry. Have faith in us. We too wish to save them. For the first time, something like determination flickers within those crystalline eyes. After looking into them, the captain finds something akin to resolve and confidence in them. He steps back. Raising his right hand to his chest, he shows the girl his watch. 
but you got exactly 30 minutes and not a second more. Understood. After the girl nods, she gives instructions to prepare a stair card to the group she is leading. The captain's fist tightens nervously. Since there are a few uses for a stair card, quietly moving it in place may make the hijackers think that a strike team is getting ready to storm the plane. But there is no hesitation in the girl's actions. Well then, move in as naturally as possible while staying in their blind spots. Eventually, a roofless stair car advances slowly towards the passenger plane. Closest we can get without them noticing will be about 10 meters from the plane. That will be more than enough. More than enough? What's the point of half doing it like that? The captain's annoyance begins to turn to curiosity. If she is replacing the SAT, then she must have a plan beyond simple brute force, but... Now, let's begin. The stair car stops. The girl gets out of the driver's seat. She walks slightly behind the vehicle, turns towards the passenger plane, and squats down. What's she doing? The captains bring up a pair of binoculars to see what she'll do. At first, he assumes she's going to use the stair car's movement as a decoy and send her team in from a different direction. Like humans, most vehicles have significant blind spots above and underneath. Yet that doesn't seem to be her plan. Does she plan to make her move while using the stair car's cover? Is she possibly going to snipe them? The captain discards the possibility it would be foolish to set up a sniper perch at a lower angle of elevation where the girl is now. While the captain mulls over the question, the girl makes an unexpected move. She appears to lower her stance slightly one moment, and the next, she is no longer in sight. By the time the captain realizes she is running, she's already reached the top of the stair car. Her slender body launches like a cannonball from the top of the stairs. What? She, she jumped? Even the SAT members voice their surprise. The girl's leap arcs a distance of over 10 meters. It's clearly beyond the abilities of a human being. Coming in the middle of a hijacking, the scene seems even more surreal. The girl lands on top of the aircraft and stands as if nothing unusual had happened. She looks at the aircraft beneath her and slowly turns her head to scan it from back to front. It reminds the captain of the movement of a security camera. He knows it should be impossible, but he wonders if she can see through the plane ceiling. She's Supergirl! Eventually, the girl seems convinced of something and begins walking. When she reaches the boarding hatch at the front, she moves her right hand to her back. The captain notices that a special knife coated gray from blade to hilt is in her hand. do with that knife? The girl suddenly lowers her stance and slides down the side of the aircraft. Just as she's about to fall, she thrusts the knife into the jam of the hatch and dangles from it. Crazy. She then uses her left hand to pull the handle and unlocks the hatch with ease. This is so unnecessary! Why do we have to go through this? Just get to Inaba already and get into the TV world, my goodness. Once the thick airtight doors door juts out of the aircraft, the girl nimbly jumps into the plane. I guess they're doing this because they want to show, like, this is what Igus does nowadays. She, like, does covert ops missions or whatever, but, like, I, I don't care. Akihiko's moment, like, in South America was fairly short and to the point to show what he's been up to, and Mitsuru's was longer, but hers was really important to set up all of the backstory of Labrys and that the Shadow Operatives exist and what the Kurijo group has, like, moved forward from Persona 3. So hers being longer was, like, important and necessary. Same with Naoto's, really, because it it showed what the Kurijo group was like now from a different angle. But this is just like, who cares, dude? Who actually cares? He begins to wonder if she intends to defuse the situation on her own. The captain lowers the binoculars and faces the reality before him with his own eyes. Who in the world is she? The doubts he had dismissed rise within him again. Hey, we're in the passenger plane. A warning light goes on in the cramped cockpit. Two people there notice it at once. One of them is the captain sitting in the pilot's seat. The other is the man holding a gun to the back of the captain's head. The light is labeled hatch open. Even an amateur could understand what it means. The man suddenly tenses and stands ready at the passenger side door. He prepares himself for someone to charge through it. But he quickly regains composure and turns the gun back on the captain. The man casts irritated glances back and forth between the captain and the door for a while, but eventually approaches the door, his gun pointed at the captain. He cautiously cracks the door open and looks towards the passenger seating. Just outside the cockpit is the first class section. But the passengers were gathered in economy class at the time of the hijacking. First class is empty. The man squints. To ward off observation or worse, snipers, the window covers were down. Coming into the darkened plane from the bright cockpit forces his eyes to adjust. But from the corner of his eye, he sees a gleam of light shining in that's unlike the regular ones. And within that light is a silhouette. Before he can react, the silhouetted figure closes the distance. A hand grabs the edge of the door and opens it with tremendous force. Two quick heavy blows follow. The man collapses without a sound. The captain turns around in surprise to see the intruder, a blonde girl with an index finger to her lips, signaling silence. She first lays the man on the ground and then removes the pistol from his hand. On closer inspection, it's only a model gun, supplemented with metal parts. The seam between the parts is in different places compared to a real gun. If taken apart, the disassembled pieces would look nothing like a real pistol. The girl then takes handcuffs from a small pouch on her waist and fastens the man's arms to a seat leg near the window. 
Even if he wakes up, he will be unable to stand. Dude, this is maybe the most bored I've been in this game, other than when I'm just reading stuff that is telling me the story of Persona 4, which I already played. <laughs> Though the captain still looks as if he wishes to say something, the girl meets his and insists on silence as she leaves. The curtain dividing first class and economy class is closed. It doesn't help that this absolutely terrible music is playing the entire time. I want to die. The girl hides herself behind it and peeks through. There's a man in each of the aisles on the left and right. Neither seems to have noticed her. The, the worst thing about this is, like, if this was, like, animated... If this was like like a like a three minute animated scene of Igus breaking in here and taking down this plane, it would be super cool and I'd be super into it. But having to read all of this text with this awful music in the background just makes it tedious and boring, for me at least. The passenger and cabin crew are are, cra are crammed into seats in the back. Everyone's placement matches the readings of what our heat sensors picked up from above the plane. Also, why is Igus... This is Igus' story, so this text is supposed to be from her perspective. Why is she thinking in third person? I hope she doesn't think in third person the entire story. Both remaining hijackers are closer to first class. The man closest to her is only a few steps away. She judges that he can easily be disabled if she moves quickly. They both carry pistols, but they are the same type as the down hacker. From what she can see, these two are mere model guns. The girl swiftly pushes aside the curtains and grabs the closer man's right wrist. If wrist, the hijacker caught off guard by a sudden appearance of the girl stops moving. He surrenders any chance of victory. With a pain cry, he drops the pistol to the ground. The girl uses her grip on his right hand to put him on the ground. Smoothly, he pulls out another pair of handcuffs, locks him into the seat. Man thrashes about, but despite the struggle, no better than a worm. The last hijacker finally recovers from his shock and aims his gun. The girl pulls a button from the other man's sleeve and flicks it towards her opponent's face. Button travels at immense speed, though it was launched only from her fingers. Man tries to shield his face, but it's too late. He groans in pain when the projectile strikes his forehead. Girl doesn't let the opportunity pass. Easily jumps over the three-seat-wide center blocks of, uh, block of seats with one arm and grabs the man's right hand. Repeats the same procedure. Weapons are immediately seized while they are restrained on the floor. The passengers are only now grasping what's happening before their eyes. A murmuring chorus rises. Do not be alarmed. I have come to rescue you. Your safety has not been secured yet, so please stay calm and remain in your seats. The passengers erupt in cheer. All right, that's going to give it away a little bit. There is sporadic applause as well, but there's a slightly hysterical tinge to it in reaction to the tension Excuse of the situation. Me. We were told someone requires medical assistance for their chronic heart illness. His name is... Just as the girl approaches the center of the plane, she senses a male passenger stand up from his seat. He is extremely calm and quiet as he does so. The girl uh, belatedly picks up on the incongruity. All of the other passengers are nervous. It is then that she feels something hard pressing up against the back of her head. She knows not without looking that it is the muzzle of a gun. The nearby passenger's cries of relief suddenly turn into screams. With your judgment to stay hidden until an opportunity arose. The girl is unperturbed as she continues to look straight ahead. The man stays silent and keeps the pistol pressed to her head. She knows there's no danger of being shot, but she is not yet sure that he was the only one in hiding. Left with no choice, the girl accedes to his demands and moves forward. After about ten steps, another man stands up, as expected. Oh, and you too. The man doesn't answer. He slowly approaches from the front. The girl is now sandwiched from the front and back. At that moment, footsteps sound from beyond the curtain, leading into first class. The two culprits both react at once, but it is too late. Over ten men in black rushing at once from beyond the curtain. While the girl had drawn the hijacker's attention with the scuffle, the stair car had closed in. First, they pinned down the man standing in front. Narrow passage to give the man a short reprieve. Doesn't last long. The moment he lowers the hand gripping the pistol, the girl grabs his wrist. Focus on the man and burst yada yada. I get it. I get it. I get it. The plane was hijacked. There are hijackers. I guess outdid them. Hooray. He is immediately tripped and restrained once he falls on his back. The girl stands up and looks around. If there were any more hijackers inside the plane, this would be their last chance to make a stand. But no one rises from their seat. She glances towards the men in black, and they nod back in acknowledgement. It seems the crisis has been averted. The girl carefully keeps her thoughts from appearing on her face and gives an inner sigh of relief. Soon afterward, the sweeper team gives a report confirming that the aircraft is secure. The girl works with the cabin crew to arrange transport for the man with the heart illness before she steps out for a moment. She stands on the stair car and turns on a blue designator light, waving it in circles towards the SAT's position. It is the signal that the crisis is over. She's done already? On receiving the sign, the SAT on standby alert, talking uh, standby, start talking amongst it hasn't themselves. Even been five minutes. There should have been at least three hijackers. You know what they remind me of? Those guys, like men in black or something. Captain, who are those people? Is that one even human? The captain sighs with reluctance. This is just a rumor. I've heard that the higher-ups formed an unofficial security group in conjunction with a certain corporation. It's supposedly for cases that are a little... strange. 
I hear they have some official standing with the police, too. Though it's all some private enterprise, so technically, there's no authority involved at all. What? But this is Japan we're talking about! A search and destroy unit that answers to no department and keeps no records. I've heard them called Shadow Operatives. He turns on his own blue light as a sign of understanding and waves it left and right. The response light comes from up ahead. The girl then sees the captain spreading his arms in a shrug and smiles for the first time. She feels slightly bad for them. Her team may have shamed them, though they had done nothing wrong. I should apologize to them later. But then... Out of the corner of the girl's eye, near the entrance of the luggage carts at the corner of the building, a figure catches her attention. A girl? Oh, what the heck? That's Labrys, but in a dress. The girl seems to be about her age and is wearing a plain cape-like dress. For some reason, her appearance feels unsettling. To begin with, given the heightened security, the parking entrance should be strictly sealed, yet the figure looks like a civilian. Um, may I check on something? The girl calls to the SAT captain over the radio. Noticing some slight interference, she looks down to adjust the frequency West. dial. If you look towards my left, in front of the luggage loading bay is... But during the moment she looked away, the figure She's disappeared. there. That can't be... The girl looks around, but the figure is nowhere to be seen. Where could she have gone in this open space with nowhere to hide? What's the matter? Oh, I... I'm sorry. I was apparently seeing things. The girl shuts the radio off. Who was that just now? Was I truly seeing things? With those questions in mind, the girl tries to remember the figure's appearance in detail. Only then does she realize the cause of her unease, that light blue dress the figure wore. It was very similar to the one she herself had once. It reminds her of those days when she did not yet have a heart. <laughs> 